Hello. Welcome back to another Art for the People live radio show. I'm Moon. I'm a photographer and poet and just revolutionary artist with Art for the People. We are an anti-capitalist art collective in Miami, Florida. And I'm here with... Um, so my name is uh, Josh. I'm also with Art for the People. I mostly design clothes and I block print. Oh, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. So we were thinking today we're going to be talking about PSL. We're going to be talking about a party because elections are coming up. It's a little bit relevant. We all saw the debate. You know, we all saw Brandon bring it home for the left side. So we thought we'd talk about maybe some alternative ideas, maybe, to these two parties. And we were going to talk about PSL. Do you want to give us like an intro, Josh, to what PSL is? So the PSL, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, is what calls itself a communist party that exists in the United States that advocates for the abolition of capitalism and the, and the development of quote unquote socialist government. Wait. Okay. Can I, um, I messed that up, I'm so sorry. Do you, if you wanna correct it, go ahead. Um, because I, I do wanna point out one thing you said, you said a quote unquote socialist government. Yes. Do you want to clarify why you put that in quotes? So the PSL describes what is necessary after the abolition of capitalism and the bourgeois state as a necessity for a new socialist government. A government that is said to be organized for the workers, by the workers, and to be a government that represents their needs. And the needs that are, ta are, that are discussed in the PSL's program and also in the presidential cam uh, campaign program, the Claudia De, uh, De La Cruz campaign. Interesting. Is the, um, is, I'm so nervous. Um, You're good. Um, so I noticed also that you used the word abolition of capitalism. And I just wanted to kind of bring up maybe this first issue that we're running into with PSL. Because, you know, I've spent a lot of time on PSL's website. I've been reading through their program. I don't have as much direct experience with PSL as Josh, but immediately the idea with PSL, just in a straightforward, I am flattening some of their program, but the idea is that we're generally talking about changing things from the inside. The idea is to push a candidate through. And there are some problems with that. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, the PSL is advocating for its two candidates right now mm. um, that are running in the 2024 election. And on the program's website, when you go on the Claudia De La Cruz and Capitalism Before It Ends Us Vote Socialist, Vote Socialist 2024 website, um, there's a lot of discussion about how, even though the election does not necessarily bring about a revolution, it's still helpful for the left, according to the candidates. And it's a beginning of them developing and building up a socialist movement. However, how, how it builds a movement and what, what a, a movement built from this campaign, how that transla translates into a revolutionary movement is left rather unclear both by the press conferences from the candidates themselves and the PSL, and also on their website and on their stated party program. So the link between how their campaign lends itself to a revolutionary movement, how it turns into a revolutionary movement, is left rather, rather unclear and rather vague. Yeah, and I think that that's important. That's something that when studying capitalism, which you end up, if you want to overthrow capitalism and end capitalism, which we want to do, you end up having to study revolutionary theory. You know, and it's important to study revolutionary theory. It's important to study the attempts, the hypotheses, the experimentation that came before with revolutions, and then apply this to every single subsequent attempt. And 
immediately we run into that problem of violence. Simply put, we run into the problem that if Claudia de la Cruz could win, which, you know, is probably a stretch in, you know, the state of the working class movement currently in the United States, Claudia de la Cruz running on behalf of PSL, even if she could win, the question is whether this brings us closer to actually overthrowing the ruling capitalist class. Because capitalism isn't just this thing that's happening. It's something that the ruling class is engaging in. It's a process that the ruling class is actually doing to the people, to the working class, to the masses, to us. And that process is capital. We study that process and we learn how our suffering really does benefit somebody. It benefits the ruling class, the bourgeoisie. It benefits Jeff Bezos. He would love to see us work 18 hour days. And if he eventually needs us to, he could very easily get that law passed when things really got to a much more heated state. But PSL kind of just wants to push through a candidate to what end? To the quote unquote abolition of capitalism? The ruling class wouldn't give that up peacefully. They wouldn't give up the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie peacefully. And the PSL talks about the workers being in power. You know, I hear a lot about it in their actual literature. Yes, the PSL is very interesting in how it talks about the transition from this campaign to revolution. Because in their program, they admit that not even an election necessarily brings about a revolution. Yeah. But at the same time, this is the beginning of their movement. When you look at their party program, there's a lot of discussion on seizing the, uh, seizing the biggest hundred corporations oh, yeah. of the United States, so about giving reparations to sections of the working class. And it makes you ask, who would tolerate that? Would any of those hundred companies, any of those biggest hundreds companies in the United States that they seek to appropriate the wealth from, why would any of them be down to no having shot. that wealth no expropriated? Shot. Why would any of the ruling class be down for any of the wide sweeping changes that the, that the campaign states it wants to implement should it end up in office? Does it know that those requests, does it know that those aims are impossible without a revolution? Because if it does know that, why doesn't it say that within its party program? And why isn't this aspect of their campaign discussed whenever they're talking about it? There's a lot of holes that are missing yeah. in something like the PSL's campaign. And, it ca and you can't help but notice this even by their own admission. To admit that revolution cannot be done through an election and also to have this campaign to build a movement, not explaining what the essence of that movement is or how the campaign transitions into a movement is questionable, to say the least. Yeah, that's an interesting word that you use. There's a lot of holes that they leave in the plan, in their theory, in their analysis of the material world. And those holes, we can't leave stones unturned. Because if we're really gonna abolish capitalism, if we're really gonna establish a government by the workers, and if we're really gonna get to a society that doesn't have classes, and therefore doesn't have the state, and therefore doesn't have money, if we're gonna get to communism, there can't be holes in the reasoning. You, you can't just skip a couple of steps. To really get there, if you really wanna get there, we need to actually, first and foremost, go right to the hole. Go right to the gap in understanding and try to understand. See where we're wrong. Test the hypotheses. Test it again. Check the variables. This is a part of social science. This is a part of scientific socialism in the process of making revolution. And just sending a candidate, particularly with the working class movement being at such a low level, where we're just now starting to get like, like droplets of some real unionism starting to work its way up in the working class movement. And we see the current candidates, Biden and Trump, both paying visits to the picket lines, 
both trying to kind of court the union leadership. But to just push through a candidate and to just talk about skipping a couple of steps, not only is it wrong, it's unscientific. It's just not how we make revolution. If we could just make revolution off of good vibes and the fact that, yeah, it would, it feels good to vote for somebody that says they want to take over the 100 biggest companies in the country. But just because it feels good does not necessarily mean that this is a correct political line with which to take, and thus a line that will reap the benefits that we hope that it'll reap. It raises questions about what an organization like the PSL even really considers a socialist society or okay. what it considers a revolution. The PSL would be the first to say, probably more so than many other socialist parties in the US might say, that China is a socialist country or that Cuba is. Wow. Even when really taking a serious look at their economies, it becomes rather obvious that they aren't, either of them. China especially, as it being one of the fastest growing imperialist countries in the world today. If PSL were to consider that a socialist country, it makes us question what their conception of socialism even is. And that would call into question the nature of their program to which they here to implement here in the United States. What does so when you read their program, it's a lot of it seems like sloganeering. It seems like calls for things that people want, like reparations and reforms to criminal justice. But these things are not necessarily changing the capitalist base of society and trying to do away with commodity production or marching towards the abolition of commodity production as we march towards um, from, a, from a revolutionary socialist state to a communist one. In fact, when you read PSL's program, it doesn't really go that much into detail about what a socialist construction period would even look like. When you were to read their, you know, in reading their party program, yeah. this isn't discussed very much. If they are to consider something like China, a place like China, a socialist country, even though it very clearly isn't economically, even though socialist politics are not in command in China's current state, with a billionaire class being allowed to operate freely and even preserved, then, China, then PSL's conception of socialism, of what it talks about, should be called into question. And then we have to ask ourselves what PSL's actual line is. What what tendency are they operating from? Are they Marxists or not? In reading PSL's program, they don't even necessarily state what, what kind of Marxist they are. They don't necessarily specify if they're Marxists or Marxist-Leninists or Marxist-Leninist-Maoists or huh. any of that. They just reference that, they just reference Marx's words. And of course, based on how they draw their conclusions about surplus value extraction, there is a clear, there's a clear respect to aspects of Marxism, but it's not yeah. clear exactly w to what extent they are. So um, PSL's line is something that itself, just as the party, pro just as the campaign, just as the party program, the PSL's actual official line is somewhat vague. Yeah, and you bring up Cuba and more specifically China. And if PSL, you know, if a party for socialism and liberation is going to claim that a country is socialist, then we really need to think about our definition of socialism. We really need to know what we're working with here. And if we're gonna talk about socialism, we can talk about three major aspects. We can start with an economic aspect. Are the means of production socially owned? Do the workers own the means of production and control the means of production in China? No. That's just not, not the case. Mm -hmm. The workers don't own the means of production at Foxconn. They work so that the owners of Foxconn and so that Tim Cook over here in the United States can make a lot of money. Then we need to look at a political aspect. Are the workers in power? Do they have state power? Yes, there is a party that calls itself communist in China. But the lessons of the Cultural Revolution have taught us that just because somebody calls themselves communist, just because somebody says that their actions are for the people, does not necessarily make that true. And in a lot of cases, not in this particular case, but in a lot of cases, it's really hard to tell. 
it's hard to tell if whether something you're doing is serving the people or serving the bourgeoisie because incorrect applications of Marxism, incorrect applications of scientific socialism, which we would call revisionism, are not easy to spot, which is why we're even talking about PSL to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, all social, yeah, socialist parties, even the way we use the term socialism, or even our understanding of Marxism, even as, just as someone can talk about Marxism, that doesn't necessarily mean that they really understand it. Yeah. And even two Marxists in the room, one of them must be right, one of them must be wrong. But just because we're both Marxists does not necessarily, yeah. just because we both call ourselves Marxists does not necessarily mean we both really are. With the PSL, the PSL references Marx. It calls itself a Marxist organization. If you were to ask most PSL members, they would say PSL is a Marxist organization. Yeah. But then we have to analyze to what extent is PSL holding true to the universally applicable um, content of Marxism. Yeah. And then it raises questions about how PSL interprets aspects of history and therefore alters how it interprets certain social phenomena like the way China is developing as a country now, as an imperialist nation now. And it raises questions about what their own conception of capital, what their own conception of revolution even is and what their own conception of socialism even is. We're yeah. kind of seeing the limitations of that the weaknesses of the PSL's line inherent within the PSL's presidential campaign. The fact that it even has a presidential campaign looking the way it does with the kind of program that it does. Educating people no more about Marxism, no more about raising the class consciousness of the people under scientific terms any better than any other nonprofit could. And I think that um, for that to also be somewhat true within the party's program itself on their website, is, um, you know, not good, to say the least. Yeah. And, you know, I talked about a political and an economic aspect with regards to socialism. And the third aspect is a special aspect that we examine when talking about socialism. Because the third aspect is key, in my opinion. Because it's the aspect of transformation. Are the politics moving in a way where the workers are taking up more and more of the roles that used to be taken up by the state? So are the workers taking up the role of running society themselves? Economically, are the workers taking up more and more ownership of the means of production and control over the means of production in society? So is China moving and transforming towards communism, a classless and stateless society where the means of production are shared by all. And nobody would argue that. I think even if putting forth these three aspects of socialism to a member of the PSL, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone is well aware that China exports capital, that China is, has enormous amount of finance capital just completely embedded, massive, massive banks that Trump even banks here in the United States like Goldman Sachs. There is big money over there. There are billionaires. They have influence in the party, this quote-unquote communist party. And that's an important thing to look at. But I did, because we've been tearing down PSL a little, but I wanted to maybe look at what the PSL's growing influence, we wouldn't call it a significant influence yet. But in 2020, I think they pulled something like 80,000 votes. And that was up from, I think, something like 5,000 votes in the previous election. And that growing influence, you know, that might tell us something about the working class movement, about developments and intensification in the class struggle, which is inevitable under capitalism. And I think that could be seen as like a positive aspect that we get to see this as kind of like a, a barometer. Yes, um, I think the PSL's um, growing presence in these kind of conversations is a reflection of the working class developing to an extent a greater degree of consciousness to social ills and um, varying sites of oppression that we see in society today. And I think the PSL's language and even the nature, even the language it uses in its campaigns 
including this presidential campaign, is a reflection of PSL knowing what people want to hear. Yeah. It knows that we're all tired of racism, of bigotry, of homophobia, of transphobia, of all manners of oppression that plague society. It knows we're tired of living paycheck to paycheck. It knows we're tired of insecure housing. It knows that a common thing we want is, the, is equality for all people. It knows that what we want is no more wars and money, and money being spent on wars being spent back in our communities. These are very base level desires that all activists locally or what have you are also saying. And the PSO also understands this. And so the PSO does, does enhance its popularity by catering itself to the needs of the people. And these are all very popular needs. You know, there's no lack of um, activity in the US politically. You know, people go to protests and people sign petitions and engage in other forms of um, social activity, of, of engaging with political life one way or the other. Yeah. And we notice that these kind of things are discussed even more as time goes on. People are beginning to demarcate who their friends and enemies are in their personal lives even based on their political opinions. So I do think that the PSL growing does reflect something positive about the working class, yeah. and that it's developing an awareness of the varying ways of which it's constrained. It's starting to ask for more than just a two-party system, because the PSL's presidential campaign does bank on the fact, not the idea, but the fact, that people are sick of the two-party system. We all just witnessed the horrendous um, presidential debate that took place, what, a week, a week ago, a week and a half ago. Nobody, I've never even seen people online take it seriously. Anybody, time someone brings it up, it's just as a joke. Yeah. So there is a clear disillusionment with the US elect electoral system. Anytime someone wants to even talk about the electoral system, it's always a criticism, and it's always saying we need more than a two-party system. People are beginning to see, and people are becoming much more vocal about the failures of both the Democratic and the Republican Party. And the PSL, if it were to ever have a chance of winning this election, it would be because of that fact. Yeah. And I think just that growing influence of the PSL and seeing this kind of barometer for class consciousness slightly rise, this is an important thing for us as people who want to overthrow capitalism, who want an end to capitalism, to study and to know materially. Materially, where are people in terms of public sentiment? What does the proletariat, you know, the industrial working class, where, where is the barometer here? What sort of ideas can be put forth? How are unions starting to have more and more of an influence in national politics? Which unions are central to this question now in the United States, this intensifying class struggle. Where do we see that fundamental contradiction between labor and capital heightened? Because contradictions intensify. They don't just fizzle out. Capitalism needs to take the surplus value of the laborer. Capitalism needs to pay you less and less in order to make more and more and just juice you for all the profit that you could possibly produce for the bourgeoisie. It needs to be done. And therefore, the working class suffers more and more and more. But people pay attention. People notice. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people might have said, oh, you know, this genocide occurring in Palestine, uh, give it a month in, in the news cycle. It's still around. People are still posting stories about this. People are still talking about this. People are still going to protests. People are still trying to help in every single which way they can. And so the question is, the people need leadership. Somebody needs to represent the working class. The working class needs a kind of advanced detachment of itself to guide it, a kind of brain which is still a part of the party. And that's a working class party. That's a revolutionary party. That's a communist party. A party that wants to seize the means of production, seize state power, and establish socialism so that we can start to move towards communism. That's not an easy thing. But capitalism will intensify. Things get tough. I'm sure everybody 
um, is very aware of the unevenness of capitalist society, the instability. About four years ago, you had lots of people, even our own friends and family, struggling to find work or struggling with unemployment yeah. because of the result of the economic consequences of of COVID and the way it was handled here in the country. And so when we're talking about developing a, a party, when we're talking about developing leadership for the working masses that are becoming more and more more and more disillusioned with the current state of affairs and more and more hungry for something greater than capitalist exploitation. Then it becomes a real question of us criticizing the nature of leadership whenever it claims it to call itself that and whenever it pops up calling itself Marxist and calling itself socialist. The people have to be much more, the people have to be much more knowledgeable about how to recognize when someone doesn't represent their interests. China is not as it is right now is not a model that the U.S. can follow or is a model that the U.S. should follow because it, like the U.S., is an imperialist country. Any socialist project, any socialist party claiming to represent the people saying that that is the goal obviously does not actually represent socialism. It so does not, and to not represent socialism, especially in this day and age, is to not represent the interests of the working masses of the world. Because even if your average coworker doesn't realize that his interests lie in the abolition of private property, which That's begins big. during the socialist revolution. The whole process of doing all of that begins at a socialist revolution. Your coworker does not realize it, but he wants that. The same way that we all want that because it's within our interest to want that. It's within our interest to want to do away with capitalists sucking us dry like vampires. And you only do something about that under a socialist society. When there is a party that claims to represent the leadership to socialism, we should interrogate what that means. Because as we know, even whole countries, even whole governments that can be called socialist or calls itself socialist might not necessarily be. We can call that revisionism. When you take core principles of Marxism, the science of revolution, and you start distorting it into something that exists outside of its universally applicable concepts. Because the way we even have universally applicable concepts is that we had to learn it through practice. There's been hundreds of years of revolutionary history for us yeah. to look at in order to learn how to do a revolution. When you start going against that, when you start picking and choosing the parts you want to follow for opportunistic reasons, or really usually it's a holdover of bourgeois ideology. It's a holdover of the way ru the ruling class has taught us to think. And when you start coloring science of revolution with ideology of the bourgeoisie, intentionally or unintentionally, you're left with revisionism. And so you're left with distortions of the party program. You're left with a party that's guiding people more towards capitalist restoration than towards socialism, more than towards continuing the revolution. All these questions exist even after the revolution. Once you get into socialism, it's not like we just pack up and we say, all right, that's it, we did it. Now we have to start asking ourselves, how do we continue to, how do we get to the point where we abolish classes entirely? How do we get to a point where you abolish commodity production? How do we march society in a way where those politics, those specific politics are in command? Because only then do you really get the, the reward at the end. That's the only way that you, get, you make it to the end. That's the only way you make it to communism. It, does the PSL's program lend itself to that kind of transformation? Given everything, organizations like it, not even just the PSL, we're not just here to rag on the PSL specifically, but any organization like that, the answer is probably no. And that's interesting when you talk about bourgeois ideology and the idea, like these ideas that serve the bourgeoisie, these ideas that serve the ruling class, these are difficult ideas to combat. Some are easy, you know, like wanting to be Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. You know, I think with a little bit of investigation, most people can come to the conclusion that this is probably not a great aspiration and they understand, at least at a surface level, capitalist exploitation. But the idea that you shouldn't support a particular type of liberation, quote unquote, liberation struggle is tough because we want 
people to have that kind of independent struggle against their own bourgeoisie in their own countries. We want to support national liberation and socialist revolution everywhere. But we don't necessarily want revisionism to take over. We don't want this incorrect application of Marxism to take over. And that gets tricky. You start to make a lot of enemies because suddenly somebody's telling you, support Cuba. You have to be anti-imperialist. You have to be against this number one imperialist country, the United States alongside there with China. You have to be against the imperialists. You have to support Cuba. But one thing is to support Cuba and one thing is to support the working class in Cuba. Those are not the same. They're not identical. In fact, it's a class struggle and it's ongoing there. And even if they were in socialism, which they're not, still the class struggle would persist. Still you would have to find bourgeois ideology and you'd have to combat it. And you know, there's tools that we know we've scientifically tested for combating bourgeois ideology, these ideas that serve the bourgeoisie, tools like criticism, self-criticism, tools like propaganda, art. You know, art for the people exists in order to give voice to our ideas, in order to combat bourgeois ideology. Personally, I wouldn't like any single piece of art that Art for the People creates to serve the bourgeoisie. That would be like serving genocide. That would be like serving the very people that feed like a vampire, you said, and suck on the blood, sweat, and tears of the working class, of the majority of people in the world. We want art that uplifts true revolution that uplifts the truly beautiful people of the world, which are the people that make everything, the masses. And making that beautiful requires a lot of transformation, not only from the artist, but also from the audience. And you know, there's this relationship, there's this unity and transformation between the art and between the artist and the audience because the artist has to question things they thought were beautiful before, things that they thought were good. And the audience has to as well. If the art is good, it'll make you wonder, wow, I really thought that Kendrick song, Not Like Us, was good. But now I have to wonder, can rap be better? Can rap really serve the working class? Like, what have I been paying attention to here? What is truly beautiful? What gets closer? What can be criticized? Where do I go? Where are the people that will take up this cause for remaking the world? And you know, revolutionary theory tells us that that's the industrial proletariat here. You know, the workers, which organize in the unions. There's a place we can go. There's a place we can go and make art and speak our voice together, organized, in a way that has worked before. Yeah, there is a um, intense responsibility as creatives to speak on the world around us. And if we are to be honest about the world around us, if we're to analyze it scientifically, if we're to be as real as we can about talking about the concrete circumstances that make up our social and political life, we can't help but admit that all things around us are born out of political processes. And all things around us, because they're born out of political processes, are born out of what create they're born out of what creates politics and that most of the time is economics most of the time what creates politics are economic policy their relations of production how we make things and so we, when we're being honest about how we think about the world and we go out and express ourselves through artistic means we're having to express what's around us and all those things no matter what, no matter how we feel about it otherwise, are made up of political process, made up of, product, of relations of production. And so all of our, if we want to be honest about what we make, if we want to be clear about what we make, can't help but talk about these things. And if we are interested 
the same way that many people who vote for these um, PSL campaigns or varying other socialist party campaigns, if we really do want an end to exploitation, to varying sites of oppression towards varying sections of the working class, and for the liberation of all of humanity, far, a far cry from the horrors of genocide and war that we see on the daily, um, even going on right now in Gaza, going on in Sudan, Congo, Haiti, if we really want those things, we have to create art that accurately reflects the world in a material sense. And we do that through the study of Marxism, because Marxism is a science that teaches us very greatly the way the world works, the way, product, the way productive relations work. And it also has the benefit of teaching us what we can do about these things. We notice that we're in a system of exploitation. It teaches us through historical practice, how, how do we get out of that situation? The, Answers of how, the answers of how we analyze things always come from a class background as well. The Marxism has the power of being a tool for the proletariat. But revisionism comes in where these different classes, because of their own class background, because of their own material reality that they're forced to live with, interprets Marxism in a way that serves their class interests. And you can see this for the example of um, Deng Xiaoping and Lu Xiaoqi and the various other capitalist rotors during the Cultural Revolution and how their class interests led to them trying to direct the revolution in a direction that lend it, leads itself back to capitalist restoration. So how we walk into answering questions also has a class background. But with Marxism, because it represents the proletariat, because it represents the working class, which is the masses of humanity, because it represents that which is within their interests, then Marxism is the way of which it liberates all of humanity. It liberates the masses of humanity that create the world that we live in. So revising Marxism obviously doesn't lead us anywhere. And this is our main criticism for, um, for parties like the, for like the PSL, but also other socialist organizations like it as well. Yeah. You know, and that class perspective is so important to look at the world from the perspective of the proletariat and to look at the world scientifically are the same thing because the proletariat's own liberation is the end of classes altogether. That's never been true before in history, which is why the overthrow of capitalism is so important and why Marxism, it's so easy for somebody to just grab Marxism and just apply it in the way that they want from another class perspective. Somebody will just take Marxism, revise it, and suddenly a petty bourgeois person, a kind of like middle class person, will put themselves at the center. Suddenly an intellectual, an academic in a university, in academia, or a writer who's published a lot of books will just not put the working class at the center. And maybe they're in a country like Cuba, and maybe they get asked to go work in a field to experience what it's like to actually grow sugarcane and cut it down. But that to them is oppression. When in reality, somebody has to grow the sugarcane. The people grow sugarcane so that we can all enjoy it. And to learn to grow sugarcane would be an honor for any member of the petty bourgeoisie. It'd be an honor for anybody because to make things for everybody in society, to make things for the people of the world is a beautiful thing. And to get art to express that is not easy. It requires that self-transformation. It requires that transformation of the audience, like I was saying. And those things are sometimes really painful. You know, it's painful to, to change yourself, to change your ideas, to combat these ideas. But we don't have to do these things alone, you know. And for example, in Art for the People, we, we criticize each other in study, in our work. And criticism, in a sense, in the way that we're used to it, is like a mean thing. But that's not the way that we mean criticism. We mean it as a kind of exploration of differing ideas in order to arrive at a synthesis, to arrive at a correct idea. But we are now coming up on our time. If you want to say anything else, one or two minutes. Um, thank you for having me on today.
It's my first time on MCR. Yeah. Oh, maybe you guys will hopefully see see me in the future. Um, and yeah, I think um, in talking about revisionism, talking about different political campaigns, it's always very important to ask what definitions of things that we're using. And also important to ask what is primary in someone's analysis. If we recognize that these varying sites of oppression are principally because of capitalism and because the world is in a capitalist imperialist system where varying other capitalist imperialist countries are in, con are in control of the world and still in contradiction with amongst each other at the expense of not just the exploited third world workers of the world, but also domestically here. If we recognize that as primary, our analysis must begin there. It must begin in productive relations. How come when we look at these varying socialist programs, these varying socialist parties, and them having their presidential campaigns, why is it that that isn't mentioned first? Why is it that in talking about the transformation of society, we're talking about handling like, these very specific sites of oppression, instead of dealing with the economic base, being detailed about the economic base that they were founded upon and that they're maintained because of? It's a question about priority. If we recognize that something is primary, that should be the beginning of our analysis. And when analyzing something like that, we have to be specific and clear about what we mean. We have to be scientific. All those things are very primary. And I think that um, those are good questions to ask when we're evaluating the worth of any socialist project, especially one that claims that some that place like China, place like Cuba, especially one that is very loose on its definition of what socialism is, loose and undefined and too eclectic to be specific and concrete. That's all. Yeah, thanks so much to everybody who's tuned in. We are artists with Art for the People. It's been a lot of fun talking about PSL, talking about revisionism, talking about bourgeois ideology. Thank you, Ethel, for making it out and giving us company. Philip, for having us here and Miami Community Radio in general. We're looking to everybody watching. I hope that you know and believe that Art for the People really does have open arms, that we are open to discussing, to making art, you know, in an environment that is nourishing, truly nourishing to like ourselves as people and an understanding environment where we make art in order to bring an end to capitalism and liberate all of humanity one step at a time. So thank you for watching, everybody. <laughs>